Right. Hello. So I'm very happy to be welcoming you here. Uh, very happy to have you here as well. I'm going to be moving a little bit more into the art world. We're going to be going back in time, 500 years actually, but looking at what that means for the future. Uh, my name is William Lobkowitz, and I actually come from a traditional art institution, which has been exploring how we can be utilizing blockchain a little bit more as a way to share these collections with the world. Now, our story, though, starts 700 years ago uh, in the heart of Bohemia. Now, here you see an example of Europa, Europa Regina, where you see Europe in the 16th century, where at the heart you see Prague. And uh, this is where the story of my own family begins. Uh, I come from a very old Czech noble Bohemian family that has about 700 years of history. Uh, we have served as chancellors of Bohemia, managing the kingdom of Bohemia for the Habsburg Emperor over the years. We amassed a very large collection as patrons of the arts. Um, if you come and visit our collections today, you'll see paintings by Bruegel, Velasquez, Canaletto, and Cranach. Uh, you ev you'll even find hand-annotated musical manuscripts by Mozart, Beethoven, and Haydn. And today we manage four different castles in the Czech, Re Czech Republic, which we've actually opened up to the public. The collection consists of 20,000 movable objects, a kilometer and a half of archival material, two and a half kilometers of library material, and uh, this is a massive undertaking to take care of, but is something that we're really quite passionate about. Now, all of these properties are open to the public, and we see visitors come year by year to visit these places. Um, and over the 700 years of my family's history, uh, it was going quite well for a long period of time until the tumultuous 20th century. Uh, the first time we saw our collections be seized uh, was under the Nazi occupation in 1939 of Czechoslovakia. Uh, my great-grandfather was an outspoken critic of Adolf Hitler, uh, he himself was one of the supporters of the first Czechoslovak state when it was founded, and for that reason he was put on Hitler's blacklist to be executed upon the annexation of Czechoslovakia. Uh, fortunately, that did not happen. He fled, uh, and all of our properties were seized by the Nazi state. Uh, six of our paintings were taken to be added to Hitler's personal art collection, the Linz Sammlung, or the Linz Collection, and all of the collections and properties were seized. Uh, we lived in exile in Britain first, and then uh, we, and you can see how these places, how the art was stored during this time period. Uh, here you can see actually a view of the interior of one of the castles, which used to ho house our library and archive, which had these 18th century bookshelves. Uh, was taken down to make room for latrines for an SS training camp that was put in place there. And then we came back in 1945. You may have heard the story of the Monuments Men. There was a movie that came out with George Clooney, Matt Damon, Jean de Jardin, the heartthrobs that they are. And these monuments men actually found all of these paintings in a, a salt mine in Altosse in Germany, in Austria. And they were restituted back to our family. And because of that provenance history, we were able to acquire them again. Then uh, communists took over in 1948, and we were forced to flee again. And uh, during that 40-year time period, many of these works of art were simply left, left in derelict storage facilities with people not really taking care of them. Some of them moved to different locations as well. And then when we came back in 1989, under the enlightened leadership and vision of Václav Havel, our poet, playwright, president, uh, we came back to this country, uh, Czechoslovakia uh, at the time, not knowing what we'd really get back. And it ended up being one of the largest restitutions in the country. Um, however, you might think restitution is a wonderful thing. It means just coming over and claiming all of these paintings back and all these castles and everything. Uh, but really, it looked like this. Um, now, this is the reality of restitution. After the Nazi period and the communist period, you had 60 years of mismanagement of this collection, and they were kept in derelict states. The properties themselves were completely destroyed in many ways. Uh, many, much of the art uh, had been greatly damaged, and we're still working on this uh, today. Um, the collections were spread across 100 different locations in the, uh, Czechoslovakia and uh, now the Czech Republic since 1993. But today we work day by day trying to restore these things and make them publicly available to uh, the world with the mission of preserving, studying, and sharing them with the world. And so that's what we're doing today. Uh, it's a very hands-on business, and about 50% of the collections we've restored. We're still working on it to this date, 
and we look at many different ways where we can do public programming to share this as much as possible. But uh, when the pandemic hit, we reached a different situation where we had to look for ways to actually continue sharing this with the world, but also find a way to make this financially sustainable uh, so that we could continue with our mission. We started, like many museums, uh, doing virtual tours. Uh, here you can see a cheesy shot of me speaking to a phone, um, which was always very difficult for me when I was doing uh, these tours. I was used to making jokes on my tours. I never knew whether anyone was laughing when I was doing uh, all the tours through these museums. Uh, but this was a way where we really started learning about the ability for us to connect with people no matter what the physical or financial financial barriers are that exist. Uh, looking for ways to, for us to connect with virtual audiences is a way that we had never seen before. In fact, I had people writing me from across the world saying that they didn't have the financial opportunity to visit Prague or never thought they would be. And now we were giving them the opportunity to share Czech and European cultural history with the world. Uh, we also did yoga in historic spaces as well. We did something called Yogart, um, which was a way of giving people a time to relax during a very difficult pan uh, pandemic. But slowly we started exploring the world of NFTs. And this is why I'm here now. So you must be wondering, what, what is this guy talking about in the end of the day? Well, we were really interested not just in finding uh, a financial instrument to support these collections, but they were appealing for a variety of different reasons. First of all, when I talked about the communist and Nazi time periods, uh, I talked about the importance of provenance history. This is something that is a huge problem in the art world today. Um, I've spent time working with uh, galleries. I worked uh, briefly at Sotheby's in the old master paintings department as well. And one thing that was very difficult is always to check the provenance history of all these pieces. What's interesting with the NFTs is a completely transparent ledger which makes this possible. It's without these ledgers, it's without the receipts that we got from the communists and the Nazis that we were able to claim back these things in restitution, without which it wouldn't have been possible. There's a new patronage model as well to support uh, museums, artists, cultural heritage sites. I won't get into that as much. The idea of ease of movement, uh, the idea of us being able to transport art in a matter of seconds to another place. Normally, when we do a loan to the Kunsthistorisches Museum, the National Gallery, wherever it is, we have to deal with insurance, we have to deal with transport, security, and just we risk actually damaging some of the pieces when they're taken down off the walls. It's an incredibly complicated process. And lastly, the idea of building a community. Now, I know community is one of the most overused words uh, in blockchain right now, so I'll try not to use the word as much. But what's interesting to us as a museum institution is getting people to buy in and get excited about the works of art that are being put on display. Getting people to identify with the pieces that they collect or find a way to connect with them a little bit more. And so for cultural institutions, I see there being a huge opportunity here. Uh, one that a lot of uh, museum institutions are looking at. We have cultural institutions which are really struggling uh, during this time period, which are asset rich, cash poor, to keep it uh, simple. And these institutions right now are struggling quite a bit. Um, after, we're coming out of a pandemic, but we're also looking at a war and a crisis that's happening in Ukraine right now. And one thing that we've been experiencing as a cultural institution are grant programs being cut. Culture is one of the first things to be cut uh, very often with public programming. And so we're looking at different creative ways to continue uh, with our different activities that we're doing on the ground to support these activities. But the NFT market at the moment is quite cash rich. Uh, there is a large source of uh, different things that are being sold. But I think there's an opportunity for museums to provide something that is rooted in our, our cultural history, something that we can build off of. And this is something that I always encourage people to be looking at all the time. Very often we're always looking for a way to build something new, build the most innovative thing and come up with a new way to approach something. With the arts, we can build off of our cultural history. We can find a way to actually take something that already exists and create something even better. And that's how we innovate, I think, and uh, don't just start anew, but build off of something already existing. So the art world right now is going crazy. Um, I just put up this slide to sort of put this in context, which is why this is what I showed our board when I had to explain um, what an NFT was in the first place, which was an incredibly complicated process for a board that consists of people mostly in their 60s, actually. And this was very, very difficult. Um, but just to look at this by comparison, and to the pe my colleagues who I used to work with in the auction world, it's crazy that a Da Vinci is selling at the same price as a CryptoPunk. Now, 
people don't understand the value that goes into these pieces. The collectibles have value. They connect you with communities and different people. But you're seeing a complete change of what's happening. And the auction houses are catching on to this. What was cr what's crazy is that you're now seeing auction houses bidding in ETH, which hasn't happened historically in hundreds of years. This is a historic moment for the entire art world. Um, they always were bidding in the national currency of wherever they were working at the time. And so now you're seeing museums enter the space as well. Uh, there has been the British Museum, who has partnered with La Colezione, who's here today, uh, which did a series of uh, prints from Hokusai, which they've sold as NFTs. You've had the Hermitage Museum, who's done a, p a couple of pieces that they've sold as NFTs as Da Vinci's. Uh, they've done Da Vinci's, Michelangelo's. You've also had the Uffizi Museum, who sold their uh, Michelangelo Rotund as well. Um, but this is what I call, there's a scan and ship model that I'm seeing here with a lot of these museums. And it's an interesting approach. Um, but the question we're now seeing is what, what, are you actu what are you actually purchasing with the sale of a lot of these things? Uh, the Belvedere also did a release of 10,000 different pieces of their uh, Gustav Klimt's The Kiss as well. Um, and you aren't in, there's also a question of what type of ownership or connection you're getting to that piece, too. Um, so this is something that we've seen explored, uh, but our approach has been a little, slight, a little bit different. Uh, we're trying to look at ways where we can try to identify things in works of art where we can show something that you can only see uh, in the digital world that you can't see in the physical. And I give an example of this uh, here. This is uh, Las Meninas uh, by Diego Velasquez. It's in the Prado Museum in Madrid. Many of you may be familiar with the piece. And I also wanted to show this piece by Eve Sussman, 89, sec uh, 89 Seconds at Alcatraz. This was on display in the Guggenheim Museum as well. And what she did is she built off of what was already a very historic piece um, to create something new. And this is something that I love seeing in the NFT space, and I'm seeing more of as well, but working with different artists to build off of our cultural history. But this isn't anything, this was quite drastic when this was first done. But this process isn't anything new. Um, I put up a painting, one of our own paintings in our museum. We have a painting by Velasquez that sh shows the Infanta Margarita. And right next to it, I put two pieces done by Picasso and Dali, which were inspired by the same piece. At the time, when Picasso and Dali did these pieces, people were insulted. They said, you could not possibly be doing this. It's an insult to the art world. It's an insult to the underlying work that was done by this great old master. Um, and then at the end of the day, these pieces are now more valuable than the original piece that you see here. Um, and so when we did our own NFT experiments, we tried to do things in a similar vein. Here we have a painting by Paolo Veronese. It shows David with the head of Goliath. And the NFT we created here uh, looked at a way of creating, uh, putting infrared and x-ray imaging over a work of art, and we animated that. I wasn't able to get the animation up here, but you can go on Super Rare if you'd like to see that. But what I wanted to show is that in the underpainting of the drawing, we see a ghostly head in the background. This was an earlier painting that was done by Veronese, which, uh, we, and canvases were being reused all the time. And we're able to actually see something in the digital world that you can see in the physical world. Uh, so this was quite an interesting piece. Another piece that was interesting was this musical manuscript, which was written by one of my ancestors, Anna Velemina von Altan. Uh, she was living in the 18th century. It was a very accomplished lute player but wasn't recognized for her musical abilities uh, by virtue of being a woman. And uh, what we wanted to do is take this piece and rewrite history, where we took a piece of music that hasn't been heard in over 250 years, recorded it for the first time, created an animated mixed media work where you see her handwriting uh, as she's drawing out the very musical notes you see here, and you listen to that music for the first time. And what's crazy is that this is now in a gallery uh, online in the metaverse where anyone can go visit this around the world. I don't know how she'd feel about this, uh, but I, it would be a difficult concept to explain. And lastly, uh, we created another animated piece of uh, a piece of scrafito. Scrafito is the technique of scratching into stone to create a design. And this was very popular in the Renaissance. And one of the castles we manage is beautifully decorated with all this scrafito. The capital costs of taking care of all this graffito, which needs to be renovated around every 35 to 50 years, is about a million dollars to completely redo the entire facade of the castle. Now, when most people invest that, uh, their, these funds into a company or anything else, 
you normally get some sort of return on your investment. And in our case, this is just part of our day-to-day -day activities to actually up uphold and maintain these things. So with the NFT we created here, we wanted to create an educational piece, an opportunity to let people know what happens to these facades over time, and we show it slowly degrading. But what's interesting about the NFT is that the purchase of it actually goes to directly fund that project, and any secondary sales that exist afterwards will continue to fund that project. The token will exist on blockchain in perpetuity. Our issue of this facade will also be existing in perpetuity, so it's creating a little bit of longevity. Uh, we also explored a concept called proof of patronage, where you would uh, purchase an NFT before, and it, before it is restored, where you'd see a canvas where there'd be a hole in it, and we set the price of that NFT at the cost of restoration, meaning that when you purchase that NFT, you know that you are paying to restore that NFT. And later, later on, six to nine months down the line, we airdrop an NFT of the restored work so that you can see it. But this is showing that NFTs don't need to just be digital, digital art. They can also be proof of people's patronage and bringing people into this whole concept of working together. I'm going to flip through these because I'm running low on time, but I, we also did some collaborations with some great artists where they were inspired by the collections. This is a piece by Matthew Stone we see on the right side over here where he was inspired by a, a cabinet of curiosities painting we have in our collection. We also did a collaboration with um, Obvious, the artist collective in Paris. I've been hearing a lot of French here as well. They are fantastic. Uh, this piece got a lot of criticism. We took maps that were in our archive. Uh, there are about 250 maps, and these are not on public display. And it's very difficult to show these maps, because if they are on public display, they're in books. So you have to flip each page as you go. And what we did with Obvious was we asked them to use their algorithm to create a GAN piece that uh, would illustrate all of these different maps in these two NFTs that you see here. Now, I had someone from the National Museum who came up to me who said, William, this isn't art. This is a computer that's done it. It's not in the hand of the artist. And what we were trying to do with our exhibition and everything we did was explain how, uh, how there is artistry in the algorithm, how there is artistry in the code to create these pieces. But now we're able to put on, some, on display something that is not seen in the public eye. Most museums only display between 5 to 10% of their actual collections, and this is another opportunity to do that. So we put on an exhibition in Prague where we put this on display. We had a forum where we invited people from the art world. Uh, I had the head of the Dali Foundation uh, right next to uh, Crypto Anons as well, which created a very interesting debate. Uh, booking a hotel room for someone who is Anon and is using a pseudonym is incredibly complicated as well. Um, but it was a great opportunity to collect, connect all these people. And with the restoration that we're doing now, we're trying to bring people in as a part of the process. So in the case of some officers, which you're going to see in this video, we send these videos to the different donors so that they, are taken, uh, they become a part of this entire process. We take them on the journey of restoration where they learn more about what's happening in these proof of patronage pieces. And this is adding a whole new level of philanthropy here, where you're taking people not on the, on the journey, not just handing over funds, but helping people understand what actually goes into this. So we're still trying to get some of these officers restored. If you're interested, you can let me know. But this is uh, a great way of connecting with people. Now, what's next? Well, we have a lot of different projects we're looking at, but we're trying to do another iteration of this conference. It's also called NFC, but we call it Non-Fungible Castle. Um, where we hold, bring in this conference and an exhibition uh, that we put on. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, go ahead and speak to me. But we're also working on an artist incubator center and education center at Nello Hosevas, which you see here. We're looking at new ways of pushing the frontiers of the technology. Uh, we have Somnium Space, which was just presenting earlier. And this is an example of a 3D NFT we created with the proof of patronage model, where you can see this guy actually is in the a physical space that we're having restored within the castle uh, as his avatar. So you're seeing the before of that space being restored. It is currently going through a three-month restoration. And what will be great is afterwards, we will be creating another 3D NFT where you will see the before and after of that restoration process. So not only are we creating a piece where people can be proud of what's there and it can be viewed in a VR environment, but we're able to educate people uh, with what goes into this entire process. And lastly, we're looking at DAO infrastructure systems to support new projects, too. Um, many, there are many inefficiencies that you see 
uh, in the real world with everything that's uh, being put together, but there are very exciting ways of creating communities around the art world. And I'm sorry, I'm way over time now, so they're going to start yelling at me. Uh, but I wanted to say thank you very much for joining us. I'd be very happy to welcome you all in the future, and I hope you stay connected to your history and stay connected with us in the future. Thank you.